Today's episode has been brought to you by Schedulicity. And also by the Mama Nurture Prenatal Yoga School. Learn to teach fertility yoga, prenatal, postnatal, and baby and me with confidence. To find out about our online or in-person trainings, visit mamanurture.ca. Just remember, we spell mama, M-A-M-A, and it's .ca. So mamanurture.ca. Welcome to episode 135 of the Connected Yoga Teacher Podcast. I'm your host, Shannon Crow. I'm a mother of three, a yoga teacher, and a trainer and consultant who works for yoga teachers. This podcast was created for you so that you can connect to information and inspiration every single week and feel supported as you navigate those jungles of being a yoga teacher and being an entrepreneur. If you have ever taught prenatal yoga or if you've ever had a pregnant student come to your class, today's episode is going to be a real treat. I'm thrilled to have one of our Mama Nurture prenatal yoga lead trainers, Rena Wren, with me to talk about the contraindicated yoga during pregnancy, as well as how we can find modifications for that pregnant yoga student. I have been asked so often, what are the poses that I should avoid teaching when a pregnant student comes to my class? Can I teach twists? Can I teach inversions? What about front extensions? What are the modifications that I can cue or props that I can use to really cater to the needs of my pregnant students? We are going to be diving into all of these questions and much more. This is a great episode that you can immediately start applying to any of your prenatal classes or to the work that you do with your pregnant students. All of our show notes are ready for you at the connectedyogateacher.com slash 135. So there you can find all of the links that we talk about today, along with clickable timestamps and an extra special bonus for you. We have put a PDF with all of the poses and notes there for you. So it's one page that you can print and take with you in case you have a pregnant student show up to your class. Also, at the end, I would love to give you a little behind the scenes update of what is happening with Mama Nurture. Because if you've been listening along in real time, you'll know that part of my niching down has been to try and get other teachers in, like Rena, to teach Mama Nurture. Before we do meet Rena, I want to share a review that I got recently. Tiana Christine from the US, back in April, you sent a really nice uh, review for the podcast and I want to make sure to give a little shout out of thanks to you. Tiana says, I'm a new yoga teacher and I'm happy to have found this podcast. I did an intensive YTT and I don't have a yoga mentor to help me. This podcast is like having a community of yoga teachers that I can listen to at any time throughout my day. Thank you for creating this platform. Thank you so much, Tiana. This means a lot in that I know what it's like to feel like I don't have a yoga mentor or I don't have a community of yoga teachers that are supporting me. And that is exactly this intention with the podcast. So I'm so glad that you're getting that from it. I want to know, dear listeners, other than Tiana, have you left a review yet? So you can either do that from our Facebook page or iTunes, and you can find the link to do that on our show notes page. Some of you will be thinking, oh yeah, yeah, I've been meaning to leave a review. And I would ask, unless you're driving or doing something where you can't stop, can you pause for a moment Go to the connectedyogateacher.com, click on podcasts, any episode, you'll see a button that says leave a review in iTunes. So this episode is the connectedyogateacher.com slash 135. It means so much when you leave a review. So if you have left a review, I want you to take a moment and give yourself a pat on the back and thank you. I also want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Schedulicity. So if you are not already using a scheduling software and you live in North America, go check out Schedulicity. It literally is an amazing scheduling software. I've been using it since 2011. That's eight years now I've been using this software and I have just seen it grow and improve. So let's hear our hot tip of the week from the team at Schedulicity. Hello, Connected Yoga teachers. 
This is Allie from Schedulicity with the hot tip of the week. We've talked a lot about how Schedulicity can help your class-based business, but we know many teachers also offer one-on-one -on -one services like Thai Massage. Through your Schedulicity account, you can seamlessly book and manage those services alongside your group classes and workshops. Those calendars are integrated together, so you'll never be double booked. If you create a new class that conflicts with another appointment on your schedule, a window will pop up to warn you of the exact dates and times that interfere. We've got your back, so you can take care of your clients' backs. Thank you so much, Team Schedulicity. Now, connected yoga teachers, let's dive in and meet Rena Wren. As I mentioned earlier, Rena is one of our Mama Nurture lead trainers. She's also the founder of Empowered Yoga Teaching, where she provides continuing education and support for yoga teachers. Rena has been practicing yoga for many years. She discovered that yoga brought her profound balance and peace in her life. And she actually went on to complete her 200-hour and 300-hour yoga teacher training with Courtney Butler Robinson. And that name might sound familiar because we talked to Courtney a while back on the podcast. I'll link to it in the show notes. It was episode 89, Yoga for Stress Management. And that was one of my favorite episodes with Courtney. I learned so much from her and I can't remember if then she connected me with Rena or if Rena connected me with Courtney. It's all a blur, and these are two amazing teachers that really show what it's like to work in collaboration with other yoga teachers. I first met Rena in person in Bermuda in the Mama Nurture prenatal yoga teacher training. And I have to tell you that Rena focuses on really empowering yoga teachers. She encourages yoga teachers to find their own voice and teach from a place of being authentic and confidence and really using their own heart and their own experience in life. Apart from prenatal yoga teacher training through our Mama Nurture School, Rena also offers yin yoga teacher training and yoga teacher mentoring on a wide range of topics. Rena is passionate about all things prenatal yoga and also about sharing variations of common yoga poses for the pregnant student. So she does this every single Monday on our Mama Nurture Facebook page, and I highly recommend that you check it out. You'll hear Rena and I talk about this in today's interview. Some of the videos that she has done will actually help you to visualize what we're talking about. I cannot wait for Rena to share her experience and expertise on this topic. So let's jump right in. Welcome to the Connected Yoga Teacher Podcast, Rena. It's great to have you here today. It's so good to be here, Shannon. Thank you so much for having me. So tell our listeners who don't know you a bit about how your yoga journey got started. Okay. I found yoga through, well, I, I worked at a law firm nearby a studio that said they had yoga. I had never done a formal class. So I went over there to just see what, you know, that was all about to do that in person. And at first I thought it was going to be, I was looking for it maybe for fitness kind of complement to what I was already doing, but then I fell in love with it. So I practiced at that studio until that teacher moved on. And then I just began learning more and practicing on my own. And that was probably in the early, maybe it was in 2000, something like that. And I needed something to do besides what I had done in college and all through the years, which was dance, theater, cheerleading, and things that you, especially with cheerleading, you don't call up your cheerleading buddies and go, hey guys, let's meet up and, you know, go cheerleading together. Maybe if you, I had played tennis in college, I would, wouldn't have had this problem. <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so that started my started my love for yoga. And, and I did a lot of self study, I practiced different styles. And then just once I realized how it was impacting my life in a calming way, in a therapeutic way, in a way that made my life more balanced, I just had to know more. Do you ever do you think back to a time where you're like, Oh, my gosh, thank goodness, uh, I was doing yoga at that point in my life. Yes. Yesterday. No. 
<laughs> every day, basically. No, um, definitely. Yeah, I've definitely had and still have times in my life. Um, I, I'm trying to think of a specific example. There's so many. Um, I, let me come back to that. I can't think of an exact one. For Such sure. a great question. Because I feel like the reason it's hard is because I, I just use it in so many ways, whether it's, it can be something simple like driving in a snowstorm, which I know for you probably is like not a big deal, <laughs> but in the South, um, and I, I do specifically remember one day driving in a, just a, my normal little car and breathing and like literally using breathing techniques all the way home, which took me like two hours because people in Arkansas are crazy when it's even talk about snow. And I thought, I didn't know how to do that before yoga. And I knew how to breathe. I was, I'm a vocalist. I know how to use my breath to support, you know, things that I do, but um, anything trying in my life, especially relationships, um, oh gosh, when my daughter was a teenager, <laughs> um, and she really wasn't a bad teenager, but, um, you know, just that time when things start, I feel like Sage is, is such a golden child that maybe, I don't know if it applies to her, but, you know, there's always those times where it's their job to push the boundaries and it's your job to, to set them. And at the same time, I was working with children and teenagers in the court system helping put families back together. And I don't know that I could have gotten through those court cases either without yoga. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing those. Um, no, Sage is not a golden child. <laughs> <laughs> she will love hearing me say that though. <laughs> she will. Uh, for our listeners, um, Rena, Sage, and I, and Sean all live together in Bermuda uh, for a few weeks. So she got to, got to know Sage pretty well. And I said to Sage, I'm talking to Rena today. And she was like, okay, say hi. Um, so let me just run through the bullet list, but stop me if there's something that I'm not saying properly. You are a mother, a grandmother, a yoga teacher, a lawyer. You help people with social media you run yoga teacher trainings. You're a lead teacher, a lead trainer now with Mama Nurture. Am I missing anything on the list? Uh, I'm a musician. Oh yeah, musician. <laughs> and so as soon as we're done here, I will book a call with you on how to niche down. <laughs> <laughs> well, you seem to be doing it really well. Like people that I talk to are like, I don't know how Rena does all of those things, but I wonder if yoga has something to do with that as well, like helping you to balance those out. Definitely. Definitely. I, one of the main things I've learned from yoga is the things to, to know the things that I value and to make sure that I have enough of those things in my life to help me have balance because the things I value that bring, that nurture my life, that bring enrichment to my life. Um, those are the things that help me stay toward the direction of balance. We talk about this um, a lot in yoga school um, is that yoga is this path toward knowing what balance looks like for you and knowing when you've been thrown off of that and how to find your way back there. And at the end of the day, this is really straight from the yoga sutras. Um, so I try, I try to have balance in the things I value too. I enjoy all the things that I do, but I don't do all of them all the time. And I really value time with my daughter and my granddaughter and her little family. And we have a standing date on Monday nights. And we, unless I'm out of town, we don't miss that. And things like that, those are non-negotiables for me. And that helps me have the, my feet under the ground enough that I, um, that I can manage, you know, all the other things that might be going on and put them in the appropriate boxes with the appropriate amount of time spent. That's really good. See, this is why I don't think you really need my help in niching down because I've seen you operate and 
I've also seen you say like, oh, this is, this is family time. Like this day is family time or you have really clear, um, and healthy boundaries, I think. Yeah. So today I'm super excited because you and I are going to have a chat about the considerations for when a pregnant student comes to our class, especially for those teachers who are thinking, oh my gosh, I have this group class, everyone else is not pregnant, and then this one pregnant person is going to walk in, and I just want to know, how can I modify these poses for that pregnant person? So we have a printable PDF for all of our listeners. It's our eight contraindicated poses during pregnancy. All of our listeners will get that. And it goes through kind of what the, what the pose is or, or what the breath is or what's contraindicated, the reason and some examples. But of what I'd love to add to that today is some of the real life uh, variations that you and I both use when teaching prenatal. So the very first one is breath retention and or strong forced breathing. And that's because it affects the delivery of oxygen to baby. So what are some of your favorite modifications or variations for that? I usually start with basic rib cage breathing and really getting the student to feel the breath in their body, just starting out because as we know, a lot of students who come to prenatal yoga or yoga in general are um, new to yoga. So they're pregnant and they're trying yoga for the first time. And so getting them to understand like even just the function of the breath, a lot of people before yoga haven't really thought about this. So the rib cage breathing and then I also like full body breathing and with the body awareness. And then I would add an extended exhale breath. So not holding the breath, but maybe breathing in for four counts and breathing out for six counts. And we know from a therapeutic perspective that that is very calming and good for the stimulating parasympathetic nervous system, which is something that we really want to do with a prenatal student. Amazing. So that one's pretty easy. Like, I feel like, okay, we tell our students, don't hold your breath, try these other (laughs) things. Don't do strong or forced breathing. So maybe like that breath of fire, we switch that out and we tell those students do continuous breath like that one. I think we can easily give them a variation. So the next one I think is not as black and white. (laughs) The number two is advanced poses that challenge and build heat. And you already said a really important point in the first one, in the one that we just did, where most people who are coming to prenatal, you and I both find this, most of those people are brand new to yoga. And so the reason why is because this adds stress to the parent and the baby, and there can be like this overheating. An example of this is any pose that's vigorous. And this is why this one is such a gray area. Do you want to talk about how you kind of know, like, how do you know when it's an advanced pose and how do we define that? Yeah, well, it's very student specific. So it's always, it depends. And one one of the main things that I teach teachers that I work with in teacher trainings and schools that I've done is to pay attention to their students and watch the class and not just practice with the class the whole time. Because one thing that they need to be looking for is if someone looks like they're out of breath or if their um, face is becoming red or they're maybe biting their lip. And I mean, those are cues to you that something's too, too vigorous, but I would say you can build a lot of, um, there are a lot of strong poses that you can work on the warriors, goddess, triangle that are strenuous enough and will make the student feel like they're getting something out of it. That's one thing that I find is students have this idea that they need to work hard when they come to yoga. Right. And there's a delicate balance of that, but anything that is too heating or causes the heart rate to rise. And specifically, I would be thinking of like a fast flow, um, 
you know, anything that would elevate the heart rate. And then of course, more challenging, challenging is dependent on the student, obviously. So you want to look at what were they doing before? Or were they already a yoga student? But, and because if they were a yoga student, something might not feel challenging to them that would feel challenging to someone just walking in that's never done yoga before. I think that's really the key point here. But I don't do, well, we talk, you and I've had this conversation about down dog, but, you know, headstand, handstand. And I know we, we have a separate thing on inversions, but crow. Um, and I'm trying to think of other ones that people like really challenging balance poses like king dancer, um, anything that requires a lot of weight to be on the upper body. Right. Even for some people, I think uh, plank pose can be super challenging if you've yes. never done it before. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I knew there was one I was forgetting. That's, that's definitely one. And what I find a lot of times is students come in thinking they want that, you know, they, they think they, they did that before or they have this idea I sometimes say they have this Insta idea of what yoga is, <laughs> um, but you know, because of what they've seen on the internet and um, usually though, you know, getting people to kind of slow down and feel nurtured in a space really helps them realize that they don't really care about what their idea of yoga was anymore. They care that they feel good when they leave this room. Right. Oh, that's so good. This one can be really difficult, like you said, either they have this idea of what yoga is. And so when someone has that, I think what you're saying, like at the end of class, they're going to really remember, oh, I feel amazing. And in addition to that, what you said about the warrior poses, we can still build strength and have a bit of challenge in that. And we know that the pregnant body is not injured. You know, it's not a medical condition. It's so right. <laughs> like we have an awareness, but also we don't want them like holding their breath or like you said, their face turning red, which often indicates that they might be holding their breath. Yeah. Okay. So this is a good one. Number three is poses that engage and or stretch the rectus abdominis muscles. So if our listeners aren't sure, those are the six pack abs, or the ones right at the front of the abdomen. And the reason why is because it this can cause stretching and or tearing of the abdominal muscles. I wish I would have known this because I was doing poses that definitely stretched and engaged the rectus abdominis muscles postnatally. (laughs) And I ended up with diastasis recti. So the examples are leg lifts, boat pose, plank pose, chaturanga, crow. So what are the poses that like if everyone in the class was doing, say, boat pose or leg lifts or crow, what are some of your favorite variations to add in there instead? I really like just simple pelvic tilts or maybe seated cat cow to start with to really and building awareness of what's going on with those TA muscles and teaching them how to feel those. But from there tabletop and then curling the toes under in tabletop, you can engage the TAs. And from there, I would say like sunbird, bird dog, and variations of that so that they can, again, can start to really feel those deep abdominals and let go of this. I want to, I don't want to use the word obsession, but I'm like, maybe I should (laughs) sort of, oh, hyper-focus on, oh, I don't want to lose. I hear that a lot. Like, I don't want to lose my, you know, my core muscles or I've worked so hard. I've worked so hard to, you know, get my core in shape or when am I going to get my abs back after, you know, I want, if I do this now, I'll get my abs back faster. And, you know, um, so again, it's just that ongoing dialogue that you have to have with students and thinking of other variations Well, I love what you said. And just so that our listeners know, when you said TA, that's the transversus abdominis muscles. And I think highlighting here, those are your really deep core muscles. And as simple as tucking the toes under and table will help to engage those muscles. That's huge. Like, 
that's a great way for people to feel them. And then when you start having the dialogue with them that these are the muscles that help push baby out. Right. This is where, you know, our, our focus want, it, it makes more sense for our focus to be. And we know that doing those crunches and um, holding planks, that those um, can create a lot of pressure there and can, can lead to diastasis. Yeah. One of the things I wish I would have known postnatally is that if I were to rest my body, my core, my deep core, including my rectus abdominis muscles would have been a lot happier. Like it would have been able to heal better, but I was so adamant that I could continue with a yoga practice and build it up. And I'm talking like I wasn't diagnosed until nine years postpartum. So I know. Wow. I've heard you say that before, but I don't think it's ever really landed in that way. That's a long time. It is. And I had low back pain. It's not like I was worried about my six pack abs. I had three kids. (laughs) I was having low back pain, but I didn't realize it was Mm -hmm. so connected. Uh, And can't there, can't there be, I mean, with a focus on that we talk about, or I know I've heard you talk about over recruiting of the pelvic floor and, was it fair to say that over-focusing on those types of exercises can contribute to that? That is such a good question. Like, I wonder, I don't know, because I wasn't seeing a pelvic health PT uh, until nine years postnatally. So I don't know what was going on with my pelvic floor. Everyone who's pregnant, please go see a pelvic health PT so that (laughs) you can know so much more than I did uh, with this. Um, I'm not sure. It definitely could have because I had trouble and I ended up having a cesarean. And we do know that all of these muscles work together. So when the transverse abdominis are firing, um, then the pelvic floor does as well. And we know that it fires during stress. So it definitely could contribute to that. It's a great question. I don't know the answer. (laughs) All right. So number four is front extension. So this is the ones that we think of, like also called back bends or heart openers, some people will call them. And the reason why is because this can overstretch the abdominal muscles. So same thing as before this overstretching. Uh, And some examples of just the front extension are camel, wheel, upward facing dog. So I love, you did a video, Rena, of camel. Can you kind of walk us through how you modified camel for the pregnant body? Yes. So one of the first things to do when you are thinking about how to approach a posture for someone who doesn't need to do it in a certain way because of pregnancy being an example here is what are the benefits? What are we trying to do? What muscles, what parts of the body are we trying to um, stimulate or work on? And how can we do that in a way that doesn't um, have these contraindicated things that we've been talking about here? So in that one, probably my favorite way to do camel is do it seated with a bolster behind and lean back onto the bolster with the elbows. That gets the heart opening. But there's so many ways to do this. And then I'm remembering that video that I did on Cobra as well, because that has the very similar modifications. And I'm trying to remember, Shannon, what else did I do in that video? (laughs) That's probably the one that I remember the most was camel and reaching back onto a bolster. But I know that you did do a few variations. Also, let me just call back to what you said, which is a really important part. The moment you're trying to find a variation, I heard you say, Think of what the benefits are for the pose. So the benefit of camel, and this it's such a nice benefit for someone who's pregnant and like baby is taking up more and more real estate. One of the benefits that we can get is that, you know, that heart opening up more of the thoracic. And what we don't really want to go for is that overstretching of the abdominals. <laughs> yeah. I think that's why I like the seated version. I think in the video, I also probably showed maybe it on a chair where you, I don't remember for sure, but where you can um, sit toward the edge of the chair and bring the hands behind and grab the edges of the chair and just encourage on the inhale, the chest to really lift and maybe the chin lifts a little bit. And then 
I'm actually trying to remember if I did one with the blocks reaching back because I wouldn't normally do that right. for prenatal. Close the blocks behind. That's okay. We'll put a link to it in the show notes of that video and then people can try the different variations. Okay. So number five is inversions and you already brought this up in that it also comes into that often advanced pose. Like if someone has never done yoga, never has done handstand, it not only hits this inversions category, but it also hits the advanced pose. And the reason why mm-hmm. is because it decreases blood flow to the uterus and can cause dizziness. Nobody wants a wobbly pregnant person in their class trying to do a handstand in the middle of the class. So examples, headstand, handstand, shoulder stand is also in there for an inversion. Some, some yoga schools will say downward dog is an inversion. Um, what are your ways to modify Let's put downward dog in there as well. So how would you modify headstand, handstand, shoulder stand, downward dog? If everyone else was doing that. I will. (laughs) Oh, such a good question, (laughs) Janet. I have never actually had a class where I I don't want to get us down a rabbit hole. Do it. Do it. Please do it. Okay. Here we come, rabbit hole. Look out. <laughs> I personally don't teach headstands, handstands in a group class anymore. Um, that's just not something that I do. So that is, is not specific. I mean, that wouldn't come up for me. Um, but I think what the best thing to do from a yoga teacher perspective who's teaching a general class and someone comes in who's pregnant is to, again, I'm a broken record here, go back to what is the benefit? What are you trying to accomplish? And if we're trying to accomplish an inversion for them in some way, and the benefit of that being that you talk about this in the manual, um, flipping the perspective, we know that can actually be good for prenatal because they get that kind of tunnel vision and it becomes all about, you know, what, what do I need to be doing for the baby, for the baby to be okay? So I would say... If the class was doing downward facing dog, you could have the prenatal student do puppy or tabletop. And down dog, I know we have a whole thing that we talk about on this, but I would just say if it's someone who wants to do that and they're safe to do that in terms of there's no diastasis or whatever, that it's maybe just a couple of rounds of breath. I try to get them to tabletop and just to do it because with down dog, you know, opening the shoulders um, you can accomplish with puppy. For other inversions, I would say for people who don't need to be doing down dog, (laughs) which I know that's a whole other conversation, but (laughs) you can do a version of legs up the wall that gives a very similar feeling to uh, what you feel in down dog. It's the same. It's the it's just a different axis. And I don't see a reason to flip mom upside down at all. <laughs> just to flip the prenatal student upside down at all. The, the closest thing that I could think to do for that would be wide leg forward fold with a block. Right. Well, that's good. Then it gets it into, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, it's just a few you kind of just have to gauge that on how they feel and what you can visually see that they're experiencing. So if they don't need to have their head below their heart, then just using the block to keep the back flat. Right. I'm laughing because I keep using my hands. Like, <laughs> it's so hard. <laughs> it's so hard. <laughs> what about for your students who, and we talked about this in Mama Nurture, if people need uh, to have more circulation in the legs, because that's one reason why we might do something like shoulder stand um, or an inversion. Do you have variations that you use? I know that we do legs up the wall, but I feel like you've offered different variations. Of which? Oh, I know. I've seen you do like legs on the chair at a 90 degree. 
that yes. would be another way to get into the circulation aspect or if pregnant people had say varicose veins or they were just feeling like there was a lot of pressure or swelling edema around the legs mhm well, another thing that i do in a lot of the tutorials is i show the option if i'm doing something at the wall i will show it with the flat on the back option and then i always show an option with the back elevated Okay. So another one that would be good for that would be just a block and a bolster building a ramp. And then um, I would just have them sit a little further away from the wall. And then the legs go toward the wall, but not completely up. And that way you're keeping the back elevated so that you don't have that line flat on the back and sort of like everything's coming at my uh, throat and I can't breathe. And another, um, no, I was actually thinking of fish. I don't know why I just thought of them, why that just popped in my head. Well, I love what you brought in about lying on the back. And this is something that's in our caution list more so is the lying on the black on the back for some people makes them feel really nauseous. So one other variation that I would say I have used quite a bit is lying on the side and putting one leg up the wall. So I encourage everyone to try that. It's quite nice. You can bend the knee of the, again, this is so hard in audio, you can have both (laughs) knees bent, but then you're just going to bring one leg up onto the wall at a time or up onto a chair and kind of lie on. And I, I will refer to the legs up the wall video uh, tutorial because I do offer that option of the one leg. And it, it, that video can be really helpful because it helps you know how to cue it. It's a little tricky to cue. Okay, great. I'm excited we can link to that one as well. Okay, so the next one we started talking about as well, number six is prone poses. So that's where we're lying on the belly and it just makes sense. It's uncomfortable. The baby is there. So it's just uncomfortable for for the pregnant parent. Um, And so I'm thinking of cobra, bow, and sphinx. Cobra being the most common because I know people who practice yoga and then they get pregnant. They're like, oh my gosh, I miss Cobra. So how do you find variations for that? Oh gosh, there's so many. Some of the ones I do for camel are the same. So there's um, seated versions that you can do with leaning back. Again, we're looking at that um, opening in the chest. You could do, and this may be where my brain was going with modified side version of fish or the supported version of fish. You can also do it um, in the chair. Uh, leaning back, just doing it at the wall is good. You just press hands into the wall. And one way I like to do that, you can also do this holding on to the back of a chair, but I, I do one leg at a time. There's two ways. You can just have them at the wall and just press hands into the wall and lean back and away from the wall a bit to open the chest. You can stand uh, at the wall with hands on the wall and take one foot back and press the toes into the turn the curl the toes under, press the toes into the floor and just do that one leg. That also gets a little stretch in the, in the thigh and lean back and then break and then do the other side. That allows to them to get a little bit deeper with support than they can just standing at the wall and leaning back. It's doing right. one leg at a time option. I saw you do that variation when we were in Bermuda and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm writing that down. <laughs> like having that Aww. leg back really helps with the balance. And it's a great variation for any students who, for whatever reason, maybe they can't get down onto the floor or maybe they, something is going on with the abdomen where they just can't lie down on the floor. It's a great variation. If they're open to it, I like to really pamper my students in general and gentle classes. And typically when I teach prenatal yoga, it's on the gentle side. Um, is anything supported that like lying back on bolsters or I specifically remember in the prenatal training with you that you would go around and build these nests for us with blankets and bolsters. And so I think it's important to note that you can work in, like, let's say, for example, you were doing a version of one of these, then you later revisit something similar in a more restorative way. So let's say that you had done the standing one at the wall and then later in class you do um just where they sit down and lean back on really propped up bolster with maybe blankets supporting their arms and things like that 
and they're still getting a little bit of the heart opening, but you're revisiting it in a more supported way. And I find that people really like that. Oh, I love that. That's a great variation. And again, it's the same. That's what we're going for is more so that thoracic opening, that heart opening, and we can get that, like you said, in a restorative pose. So number seven is closed twists. Uh, And this is because there's too much pressure on the abdominal cavity. And again, it has to do with the comfort of parents. Like it just doesn't feel comfortable to twist in, close in when you're pregnant. And so if we look at, say, like revolved triangle is a great example or a seated closed twist. And I know you have a video on this, so we will be sure to link to that as well. Do you have anything to add to this in terms of, well, how do I know if it's a closed twist and what modification do I offer then? Yeah, a closed twist is anything that you're moving baby toward something that it becomes in the way. <laughs> so a, a leg or a knee, like if you're seated in uh, any version of like Marie Chiasana, that whole series would be a closed twist. So you just kind of have to think, well, if you're not sure what a closed twist is, then think, well, what would be an open twist? It's really the good question. So an open twist would be where you can move in, you know, usually we're focusing on, on the shoulders and the chest area, but you can move in a direction of a twist and not bump up against something. And we keep twists not as deep. And one of my favorite things, and I think I want to say that Courtney is the person that I picked this up from is take baby with you in the twist. So, you know, hands, hands there. And even if it's not like noticeably showing a baby yet, but just hands um, on the abdomen and breathe in. And then as you breathe out, just take baby with you. I don't want to say as far as baby will go, but just a little bit and then let the rest of the twist be in the upper body and be okay with that. But by having it open where you're either seated in a strut with the legs apart or you're seated in easy pose, you're not doing anything with the knees coming towards the chest and a seated twist. And then with standing, you just wouldn't twist toward that leg, that front leg, like if it was revolved triangle. But so many twist options that you can do. Gentle twisting. Those gentle twists can feel really good on the pregnant spine, especially if you can find words for cueing that are centered more around the thoracic and the shoulders. Because again, as pregnancy progresses, the it becomes more difficult to breathe. And then the shoulders start to round forward a little bit, the thoracic's gonna round forward a little bit. So having the students, you know, set up really nice and tall and finding twist options that can work for them are really good. Yeah. Oh, this is good. And honestly, this is a lot of the way that I focus my twists now anyway, is I focus more on the thoracic in my own practice and with the students I work with. I feel like as a newer teacher, I was really focusing on lumbar twisting and I don't need that (laughs) personally in my own body. And a lot of the students that I work with don't either, but we, especially in our society where we're on our computers and we're, you know, texting and all of that, we need a little more opening up in the thoracic. Our pregnant students, for sure, like you said, it feels really nice for them. But I do want to say that twisting is okay. Like, you know, when I was pregnant, I remember one person telling me not to lift my arms up over my head. Another person told me, don't be dancing. And different people I have heard say, don't twist. And if we just look at like, I'm sure you've said this example, if we want to look back and we're driving our car, and we want to look back and see, <laughs> we have to twist to be able to do that. Um, yeah. And I think it is, you know, not to belabor the point, but the thoracic spine is meant and built to move that way. And the lumbar is less built to, to twist as deeply. And I think this is a disconnect too, a lot in the yoga, just I don't know if it's just in the yoga world or just with classes that I've been to or things that I see teachers teaching, um, I think you can create some discomfort in the low back and the sacral area by focusing too much on lumbar twists. We, I mean, we know the sacrum and the whole sacral complex is not um, designed to move a whole lot. It's designed to absorb the movement of the other parts of the structure of the skeleton. And forcing deep lumbar twists can put a lot of pressure in that area, which just 
isn't good for anybody, much less a prenatal body that's, you know, beginning to modify itself to make room for baby. Mm -hmm. All righty. So number eight is hot yoga. And the reason for this is that there's overheating, which can cause miscarriage and or birth defects. So we know that there are studies to say that we don't want to overheat pregnant people. And in yoga, our examples for this is like a moksha class or a Bikram class or any heated class. And I have had people say to me, well, I did hot yoga before, so I think I can still do it. Or I'm from a really hot place, so (laughs) I can still do hot yoga. And I think I just want to stress that this is how Rena and I teach. And I want you to add to this as well, Rena. Like, I would not teach hot yoga to pregnant people. That doesn't mean that yeah. I'm going around telling people, don't you be doing hot yoga and don't you? <laughs> yeah, I will sometimes say in trainings, okay, don't walk out of here and go to that one class and say, Rena said not to do this. Because, you know, I think you and I both would agree that we have an ethical and teacher obligation to teach in a way that we feel like, based on our study and experience, is the best version of anything we can teach. And we feel strongly about that. We study a lot. And I'm going to take this back to something that you say a lot, which is, what's the benefit? If we can't come up with a known benefit of doing something, but we know that it can harm then why are we even having the conversation? There's so many things we can do to support prenatal students that don't involve putting them in a heated room. And I I know this is a topic of a lot of debate, but like you said, this is how we feel about it. And when we step into a classroom to teach prenatal students or prenatal students are coming in, it's not going to change just because somebody wants to do something. I mean, we feel strongly about the way we proceed based on what we know to keep students safe and to provide an experience that is nurturing to them. Yeah, that's really good. I feel like that's a great place to close. So again, these eight contraindications will have the PDF all ready for you in the show notes. And also you and I are doing... I feel like when this episode releases, if I'm right, or it'll be there, it's on September the 16th. That's what I know that we're doing an online where we're going to go more into the caution poses as well, because those are ones that are not as black and white are not on our list of like, we don't teach these eight things. And there's a lot more discussion. So we're doing that live. If anyone wants to join us and if you're like, shoot, I missed it. Don't worry. There'll be a replay. And we'll have a link to that when it's ready. Is there anything else you would add, Rena, in terms of teaching to the pregnant student? Like a lot of the time what I hear from teachers is, oh, wow, I'm super nervous to teach pregnant people, which I just want to say I was when I first started teaching to pregnant people. Is there anything else you would add? Yeah, I would just say you kind of alluded to this earlier, but it's not that you need to treat them like they have a medical condition. They're just carrying a human that's being, you know, assembled. (laughs) And what I find more than anything is that the best thing to do is to create a space that is soft and nurturing. That doesn't mean that you never can do any challenging postures. That doesn't mean that you can't do a standing series, but provide a, a bit of a sanctuary for them to feel like it's something just for them because they'll be spending a lot of time thinking about, everybody but themselves, especially about, you know, when baby arrives. So giving them that one thing or that one space. um, And that's really, I think, why they come back. They learn something. They they feel good when they leave. And just also a reminder to think about the benefits of the poses that you're teaching. You know, don't freak out. Take Take a breath. This is a tip that we give yoga teachers all the time. Put everybody in something where they won't notice and like put everybody in something where they can close their eyes or where they'll be looking down or child's pose or something like that. Seated meditation with their eyes closed so that you can just take a minute, kind of gather yourself, think through um, your, you know, your go-to things that you would do and keep it really simple. I think, yeah, I think that's, yeah. 
That's great. And so you have a mama nurture training coming up. I'm super excited about this. Do you want to tell us the dates and the details of that? I do. It's the first weekend of the month, November through March, 2019, 2020. And it's in Conway, Arkansas at Conway Counseling and Wellness. The trainings will be all day, both days. I think the schedule is around nine to six, something like that. And I'm so excited. You know that I have said so many times repeatedly that the material is so good. The manual is put together in such a thoughtful way and it's really fun to learn. And I would say it's not just open to yoga teachers. If you have people who are doulas or, you know, want to learn more about how we apply yoga to a pregnant body, um, it can be great for anyone in the health profession revolving around prenatal wellness and health. That's great. I'm super excited. And I'm really excited because this is part of my niching down is like passing this over and getting other teachers to share this around the world. And you have said, Hey, yeah, I would travel with this. So if somebody's listening and they have a studio and they want you to go there, I would encourage them to also reach out to you. We'll have the link for that in our show notes. Thank you so much for your time today, Rena. Thank you. It was so much fun and I was super happy to be here. Well, connected yoga teachers, I want to hear from you. What was your key takeaway? Are you feeling like now you can go and teach a pregnant student and know these are the contraindicated poses and here are the variations that I can use? And do you have more questions? I always feel like I've done a good job of sharing something when people have way more questions. So also, do you not have any questions? (laughs) Rena and I, like I said, are doing an online training and that replay will be available. So even if you're listening to this and you feel like, oh goodness, I think I missed that, not to worry. I will put a link to the replay and how you can get a hold of that in our show notes. Also, if you're feeling super inspired and you want to learn more, you can take the Mama Nurture Prenatal Yoga Teacher Training. This is an 85-hour in-person training. It's registered with Yoga Alliance so that you become a certified RPYT, Registered Prenatal Yoga Teacher. Right now on the website, you will see that there are two trainings, one in Meaford and one in Arkansas. Now, there is talk of there possibly being another teacher training in Bermuda if there's enough interest. I love Bermuda. I have friends in Bermuda. I was just there last year sharing Mama Nurture, and I've been asked to go back, and I'm considering it. If there are enough of you that say, hey, pick me, I want to be in a warm and sunny location in about end of February, beginning of March, you might just see me there. (laughs) So if you go to the connectedyogateacher.com website, you can look under work with me and find the link to our Mama Nurture website, or just go to mamanurture.ca. Again, that's M-A-M-A for mama, and it's .ca, mamanurture.ca. As promised, I want to share a little update of what's going on with all things Mama Nurture, and specifically with my own work with niching down. So many of you know that I am passionate about niche work and niching down, and many of you might have heard me say, or maybe you haven't heard me say enough that niche work, in my opinion, is a continuous process. Always I'm looking at my list of things that I do, my revenue streams or the tasks that I take on in life, because some of those are not revenue streams. And I am looking at them thinking, what would be the next thing to go off my list? And Mama Nurture has never made the cut of like, this thing will go off my list completely. But what has happened is over the years, I know that I have specialized more and more in pelvic health. And that definitely does weave into prenatal and postnatal. And I am thrilled beyond belief when I get to work one-on-one with someone who is pregnant and wants to really be empowered with their pelvic health. I feel like that's one of my favorite places to be. This actually happened at work yesterday and I was just so lit up. And I know that it's one of my favorite things to do. So what's happening now is my plan was to find lead trainers, both in the U.S. 
and in Canada and possibly in other locations. That was my plan last year. And the plan half worked. So Rena jumped in and just really fully embraced becoming one of our lead trainers. And I know Rena really well. I know that she teaches yoga teachers already. And the energy between Rena and I worked so well. And she was on board and ready. And also had all of the other credentials that we were looking for with Yoga Alliance. And we even have a little bit more with Mama Nurture than Yoga Alliance does in terms of who our lead trainers can be. Some other like check marks that they need in their experience in life and teaching yoga teachers and teaching yoga. And this didn't happen in Canada. In Ontario, I led the training and I didn't have a co-teacher teaching there with me last year, this year. (laughs) Sorry, I'm getting mixed up with my years. I'm already jumping forward into next year. So in this year, in 2019, which for some reason in my brain feels like last year, just because it's our last teacher training. So in 2019, what I did have is I now knew and trusted that we had a lead trainer based in Arkansas that was willing to travel to different places, especially in the U.S. What I didn't have was someone in Ontario trained with all of the credentials that we needed. And so what happened is that Beth, if you're listening, Beth, huge shout out of like just gratitude for you for always hosting Mama Nurture in Meaford, Ontario. It's close to me and it's super close to my heart. Beth said, I need you to lead this training again, and I'm not sure if I want someone else to do it. And I totally appreciate where Beth is coming from on this. It is so hard to pass a baby like this over. (laughs) And that's what it feels like to me. It means so much to me that our Mama Nurture lead trainers really care about the program and really care about pregnant people in this world. So... The update is that, yes, I am leading Mama Nurture in Meaford one more time. The exciting part is that Cindy and Melanie are joining me. So there will be three of us and we all bring something different to this training. So it is going to be exciting. Cindy is also an admin on our team. She teaches children's yoga teacher trainings. She is a kundalini yogi and a mother of five children. Melanie is a prenatal yoga teacher based in Ottawa who teaches large prenatal yoga classes and has been doing that for a while and has really taken on this niche. She teaches at a college. So she has a whole different skill set in teaching that both Cindy and I don't have. I am thrilled to see the three of us come together. We've already started the planning for April of 2020 of how this training is going to come together. And we'll see what happens. My plan is that then they will be able to take this training and share it in different parts of Ontario and in different parts of the world. And we will see how things come together with that. I want to share this with you, Connected Yoga Teachers, because niche work isn't a straight line. If ever you are feeling like you need some help with your niche work, I am here. You can book a consultation call with me. Go to theconnectedyogateacher.com and look under work with me. Or you can go back and listen to the many podcast episodes where I talk about niche work. Or just for today, you can sit with the question of what is the one thing I would love to take off my list right now? It might be something in your home. Maybe that one thing you'd love to take off your list is cleaning your windows. Gosh, that's one thing I'd love to take off my list this week. Maybe it's something with work. Maybe you are teaching a class that is draining you. Maybe you have planned a workshop and it's just not moving forward in the way that you had wanted. What with work would you take off your list? And it doesn't mean that you take it off today, but your brain will start to work on how can I take this off my list? So I'm super excited to report that me taking Mama Nurture off my list means that I want to take certain parts off my list. The creating the manual, the creating the content, the updating with all the information with the public health, the support of the teachers, our lead trainers, all of that stuff I get super excited about. And I know that I can only do so many things. So if I am going to turn my attention to pelvic health professionals 
or turn my attention to helping people in my community with pelvic health issues or turn my attention to this podcast and helping yoga teachers. I have to be able to pass some other stuff on to other people. So thank you so much for listening to my update of where I am with things. (laughs) This has been a little side note, I would say, of this episode. Thank you also to our amazing Connected Yoga Teacher team for making today's episode possible. And thank you, dear listener, for hanging out all this time. It means a lot. Before I sign off, I want to know what you will be doing this week to stay connected to yourself, to your yoga practice, and to your community so that you can share the yoga that lights you up. 